Hey, hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Living with XXY podcast series. I'm your host, Ryan Briganti. So today we're going to be covering a topic within our community, male infertility. Um, for those of you that um, are just tuning in, um, this podcast is all about Klinefelter syndrome. It's a genetic um, chromosome that we, um, us males, have been diagnosed with an extra X chromosome. So today I have Ted Clark, who's 40 years old from Massachusetts. What's going on, Ted? Hey, how are you? Doing well. So Ted is going to talk a little bit about his story on how he got diagnosed with Klinefelter syndrome, and then we're going to kind of break into um, his fertility journey. So can we kind of um, kind of just take us back to how many years ago were you diagnosed with Klinefelter syndrome and, and what got you, like, how did you come up with, or how did you go to the doctor? Or what did you do that um, kind of got that diagnosis? Uh, so this was three and a half years ago. I was um, concerned with the size of my testicles um, and um, my girlfriend at the time had made a comment and had said that they were kind of small. Um, so I, I uh, had gone to the doctor and asked them to do some tests. Um, they thought there was a chance that there could be a tumor, uh, in my brain that was suppressing a gland that was sending testosterone to my testicles. Um, but once that was ruled out, um, they started doing chromosome tests and realized that I am mosaic Kleinfelters. I have 47 XXY. So those of you that are listening, mosaic within our community is really rare. Um, and mosaic is where the cells have, um, the person might have some cells that have um, XY and then also XXY. Um, there isn't a ton of information on mosaic versus non-mosaic. So uh, myself, I'm non-mosaic. So all my cell line is 47XXY. Um, so I'm curious about kind of your girlfriend mentioned that you had small testicles did that make you feel like how, how did that make you feel and what like what pushed you to advocate for yourself and instead of like curl up and and be like oh my this girl is like making fun of me uh, i felt uh, a bit inferior um but uh, well i <laughs> i have had a lot of girlfriends so um and i never had any comments um so i figured that maybe it was just abnormal to the average size um but um yeah i don't know i i um kind of brushed it off um didn't really think much of it other than once I had gotten the diagnosis, um, I was very surprised and a little um, scared, a little angry, I guess, um, but more confused uh, more than anything. So it pushed you, her concern, it, did it come across as a concern from her? Uh, yes, because she's a nurse. Okay. So it came across as a concern and it pushed you to advocate for yourself, not knowing yeah. what's going on or anything like that. And um, so what did you... What I, did... I, I searched on the internet um, and then it wasn't, I don't know, six or nine months later that I came across living with XSY. And so how many, it, it was how many years ago that you got a diagnosis? Three and a half years ago. Okay, so three and a half years ago, diagnosed and advocated, got diagnosed. And what was your diagnosis like? How was the bedside manner of the doctor? Was it a phone call or how did that? Uh, it, it was a phone call. Um, at the time, uh, I was working at a skating rink. Uh, this is a Zamboni driver. And so I needed to get back in, in the rink as soon as possible. But I was getting this phone call and I was very confused and he told me over the phone that 
um, that I couldn't ha- I couldn't have kids. Um, so I was shocked and angry at the time and um, disappointed, but um, I, I had to just deal with it and, and, and get on with my night, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't until the, later that night that I was able to call my girlfriend and, and give her the news uh, that I couldn't have children. And from there, um, we decided on having um, the micro done. So what, I mean, you had to get back to work and when you got home and you finally like had the time to, did you have a grieving process? Like how did you, how did you overcome the diagnosis? Did you Google it? Like, what was that like? Um, I Googled it. I read up as much as I could. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of information on, on mosaic clan filters. Um, there was more, I, I was, I was going off of, of just Kleinfelter syndrome, uh, on that information. So it was looking kind of bleak, um, wasn't promising. Um, and I, I, at the time, I didn't even know that there was any type of surgery that, that could be done, um, uh, for me. Um, yeah. So That's- you learned, you were learning about, you know, the fact that you were infertile and and being a man and and then all like having the smaller testicles did a lot of things like start to make sense did did you yeah um i mean there there was i was in a relationship uh years ago um with a girl and we had a lot of unprotected sex (laughs) and um and it never occurred to me that you know, that I could have had a dozen children by, by her, um, you know, and it just, nothing really clicked for me. Um, it, it was really like, almost like, uh, hit, being hit with a spotlight for the first time, like, oh my God, like that totally makes sense. Um, my, my, my learning dis- uh, disabilities from growing up that totally makes sense. Like my mother said that um, I was uh, a late learner for for trying to walk when I was a toddler. Um, so that makes sense. My, um, you know, learning to read by the second and third grade, um, you know, that, that makes sense. I, I, I specifically remember trying to read the word the and try to, stabbed it out and everything and just didn't make sense to me and finally the teacher was getting so frustrated she just told me the answer and was like it's the it's the just remember t-h-e it's the and (laughs) um so you know it a lot of things finally finally made sense um for the first time in my life was it a relief to kind of have a key to that door that you never were able to open yeah it was so with kind of moving forward where is it something that you guys were trying to have kids or was there was it no um um it was more like once once i found out and her being a nurse and and uh really talking to some of her colleagues and whatnot it was like all right let's let's just let's just have the surgery and then we'll just freeze the eggs and if we want to have kids down the road then we can if hopefully if they turn out to be winners um and so it wasn't until um probably about 10 months after we had the surgery um is when we got engaged to be married and after we were married we had the we had the embryo uh put in, in into my wife 
So can we kind of go back? Um, so Mike Ortiz or Tessie, uh, multiple pronunciations, um, is a surgery basically where they take uh, like fine needles, cut open the testicles, and try to, through microscopes and stuff, try to retrieve sperm um, to be able to do IVF. So when you got that, the when you got the diagnosis, did you, as you started to learn about Klinefelter syndrome, did you? Did you learn about like TRT and um, like some of the other things that you could help yourself or did you have um, your blood work tested for testosterone and did you have normal levels? Um, I did not have normal levels. I had um, like uh, 0.23 or something like that. Um, something that's very lower than what it's supposed to be. Um, and I was warned that, um, once I started testosterone, uh, testosterone therapy, um, that, um, the testosterone kills all any remaining sperm. So I had to have the surgery, um, before I started the, the testosterone. So I, we, we were in a, in a mad rush to get the surgery done so I could start testosterone finally. Um, because because um, other than my physical appearance of less body hair and not being able to grow a beard, um, it was also having less testosterone. It was definitely um, like low energy, depressing, um, just a state of mind that I didn't want to be in anymore. And I was suffering from it for uh many years so we wanted to get the the micro testing the ivf done as, as soon as possible so the basically the your head in the clouds like you have constant fog you have no energy low sex drive like all the common symptoms of low t and then and then you started to learn about it that oh i have low t and this could potentially help me um so what was it like researching and learning about micro tests and and um, the cost and, you know, finding a doctor, what, what, what was that whole experience like for you? Uh, well, um, my, the urologist that I was, um, forwarded to, uh, outside of Boston did the surgery. Um, so, uh, we didn't have to search for anybody, but, um, when it came to, my wife, um, she was already a nurse, so she, so um, South Shore Hospital, where she worked, um, had already set her up with um, getting uh, the IVF done. Um, so we didn't, it wasn't much of a worry to, luckily Massachusetts is full of doctors and, <laughs> um, and hospitals and great um, colleges that are teaching medicine. So um, it wasn't much of a um, a struggle to to find anybody. So when you got when you got the diagnosis and you know running into micro tests, how it's expensive, IVF is expensive. Um, yeah. Did you guys tell family and friends about your diagnosis? Yeah. So I, yeah, yeah, I was uh, I tried I tried to tell as many people as I could. Um, about what was going on because a lot of people had no idea what what micro testing what you know the IVF uh, process they they had it was mind-blowing to them um, what was going to be done um, but I just kept saying God didn't want me to have children but you know science over science won on this one I mean so what was that like for you opening up and, and sharing your story of, of this diagnosis and then going through this medical pr like process to potentially have kids. Um, did you, did you have support? Did you have people that judged you? Like what was. No, I had full support. I, uh, you know, I didn't have anybody say, uh, like I was expecting someone, someone to, to give me, um, you know, a hard time, like jokingly, like, Oh, you're not mad enough to have children or, something like that um but i didn't i didn't catch any flack um everyone was very supportive um no no wisecracks or anything i think it's extremely important you know to talk about 
when you tell if you tell people i think it's a huge thing in our community because of the stigma that's online and so it's really it, i really appreciate you opening up um putting yourself out there in this vulnerable way to share your story because it really makes a difference within our community to break down the stigma and for those of you that don't know like there's a lot of um stigma online about Kleinfelter syndrome micropenis mental retardation uh, the termination rates are above 70% as studied from 2006. So all of these things go into play. And here's Ted, like not knowing that he has this diagnosis until 37 years old. Um, you know, would you say that you would, were hiding in plain sight, like that you, you have this genetic condition that's extremely common, but nobody would ever know if, unless they checked out your testicle size? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. So going through micro tests, like how did you mentally prepare for it? Um, how did you, did you put all your eggs in one basket as far as like, we're going to get sperm um, or were you prepared to not be successful? Uh, we had thought about adoption, um, but I was adamant about, I, I wanted my own, I wanted my bloodline to continue. And that's really, <laughs> that was it really. So, Unfortunately. Kind of, so what was the, what was the uh, process like for preparing for the micro, the surgery and, and um, the financial, you know, was it covered by insurance or was it something out of pocket? Um, ours was covered by insurance because of my wife's insurance because of working through the hospital. Um, if she wasn't working for the hospital, we probably would not have been able to do the, the, the surgery at all. Uh, but because of her, because of her great insurance, being a nurse, um, we were able to, to get it done. And how was it preparing for the surgery? And then the surgery. Um, there was no real preparation because I didn't really, I didn't really know what I was getting myself into. Um, I guess I was, uh, I was told, you know, what would happen, um, and then, you know, by by the urologist, you know, he everything was explained and broken down, but um, it wasn't until after the surgery that I was like, holy moly. <laughs> What did I do? Um, my my testicles were like five times larger than they had normally been, um, and were were probably normal size for a regular person uh, because they kept hitting my leg, going back and forth when I was walking. I was like, "Is this what normal people feel like all the time?" <laughs> um, and they were just swollen from being cut and cut into. Um, but the um, we there was a success. Um, they had found five single sperm, only five, um, whereas the normal man, um, you know, will ejaculate a hundred and fifty million sperm. So. Um, yeah, success um, was on our side. So what was it like coming out of the surgery and, and did they tell you right away that they had success? Um, yes. Um, they said, yeah, we found five sperm and um, we're going to freeze them right away. Um, and your your wife, uh, she her eggs were successfully taken out. They had, they had taken 15 eggs out just to just to be sure um and they had um they had not yet had um placed the sperm in the eggs they freeze them first and then wait a couple of days um for all the everything to be okay and then um we decide uh, which ones or how many we want we i mean we could have had triplets if we, you know, if we wanted to, um, but we just decided one at a time and see if those, if the sperm that goes in the egg or if the uh, embryo survives long enough, then they refreeze the embryo 
um, and then um, they decide after that when to plant it in my wife and we had one planted in and that was successful and we have a three-year-old daughter wow that's that's heavy i mean that's that's incredible that you had success um were you given a, a percentage of your success rate before going into doing micro tests um i i don't i don't remember what i'm sure there was a number but i don't remember what it was did they tell you that it was like extremely rare that most likely they won't find anything? Um, they, yeah, because, um, before I had, uh, before I had the surgery, um, I had gone to the doctor, had given, um, a sperm sample three separate times and each time I found nothing. Um, so, um, they were skeptical that there was any chance um yeah they didn't give me a percentage i you know if i would guess it was probably a you know a point zero zero one percent chance of finding anything but we i wanted to take that chance so and here uh, you are you have a three-year-old yeah. daughter so that's i mean congratulations man that is thank you so that's so amazing that going through what was just like a comment from your girlfriend to then having getting married and getting engaged and then having a three-year-old daughter. So basically your wife did IVF at the time that you did micro tests and they were able to, um, did all of the embryos take as, as did they do five and five or, or how did that work? Um, five sperm, five eggs, um, two of the embryos were not successful one was my daughter and then the other two were were frozen still so you you have potentially two more chances of having two biological kids um i did have that chance uh, unfortunately we got divorced and so she had to terminate the last two okay sorry about that that's all right so kind of Let's let's go into um, you know finding out that you guys are pregnant. You know when, wh how many we how, how many weeks did you find out that your wife was pregnant and that that you guys were it was on the healthy path? Um, I think it was. I think it was four or five weeks. I'm I'm not certain. Um. But yeah, once it was, once it was pee on the stick and everything is goes good, um, and it was successful. Then we were we were ecstatic. Um, we just we couldn't wait for for a baby. <laughs> what was it like when your daughter was born? Um, it was I was right there and I watched her come out and. Um, that, that was overwhelmingly um, just excitement and a little bit of worry and a little bit of uh, a more more excitement than, than anything. I think um, it was like shock and awe, like oh my god, they're I finally the, they said they said it couldn't be done, and here she is. <laughs> so what's it been like for you? going home and and the shock wearing off and knowing that you're a dad and knowing that most likely biologically it wasn't you know that this this is like wasn't in your cards but it is and now she's here and you're a dad what's it been like being a dad and just you know um it's just it's awesome being dad um and it's just i i would say the you know um science prevails on us on the scale um you know god didn't want me to have kids and humans were like oh, i i'm pretty sure we can do it you know and um got it done so um and just being a dad is is awesome uh i this little girl is my world um you know i love her so much and i wish 
I uh, wish I could see her more, um, but um, it is what it is. Um, and um, I don't know. It just it's great being a dad, um, and and knowing that she's mine. She's not part of somebody else's. She's she's all mine. She's gonna grow up with, you know, she looks exactly like me. Um, so. <laughs> Um, it's, it's just one, it's wonderful. So I'm kind of like, want to go back to a little bit about after your surgery and, and once the surgery is finished and over with, and your testicles were massive. Um, and that's one of the great things that I, you know, I look at having small testicles is actually like an awesome thing. Um, most women think balls are disgusting. Um, Mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about them on a bicycle or running or any of that stuff um those uncomfortable feelings of that um it's all about embracing who you are and and like all the stigma you know shooting down all the stigma by opening up and sharing your story um what was it like with researching and getting on testosterone and how how quickly were you ready to get on testosterone once you had your surgery done uh researching uh, um there wasn't much i can't remember but i don't think there was much information other than um you know the injection or the the cream or the foam or whatever um i I definitely didn't want to do the cream or foam i didn't want to rubbing off on anyone or on my wife um and um yeah. I, the, what did you What did you start on? Did you start on injections or or? I started on injections uh, in the glute, um, and so my wife would do it for me, um, and it was once a week, two hundred milliliters, I th- milliliters, Is no, that mill- ml M- and mg. I think it's the same thing. Yeah, ml. Yeah. Um, once a week and then once um i think once i don't know if it if it takes a while for it to build up in in the, in the body um but once it got like built up um after about six or eight months that's when it was reduced to 200 ml uh, every other week and that's what i'm on now and i just uh now i just do it in my thigh i just inject it in my thigh and what uh, what has been the have you noticed any negatives and or what has been the positive change in your life from going on testosterone um positive changes are definitely um more energy i I don't feel like i'm in this fog this cloud anymore um i'm able to grow a beard like i'm women love the beard these these days so <laughs> so um that's one thing um all of the back hair i'm not a fond not too fond of um but um no it's overall um i would say it's definitely a positive going on testosterone for sure um and, and now that you kind of are on your own are you doing your injection you are doing your injections every other week yourself yeah my, my upper thigh yeah yeah the thigh oh man intramuscular um i look at that as a thing of the past i mean i've when i was diagnosed at, at uh nine and or that my mom was diagnosed in utero but i was told at nine and then i started testosterone at 13 they started with once a month injections in the shoulder in the deltoid and then throughout my life with testosterone i've pretty much tried almost everything out there except the testopel um and the jitenzo which are kind of newer and um once a month once every three weeks and then just doing it in your glute doing it in your leg the thigh is definitely a um it it takes a lot of nerve it takes a lot of um building yourself up to get ready for it to do it um and then you got to watch out for your blood vessels in your leg which you have more of um Mm -hmm. so i definitely have the experience of doing trt for 24 years now um it's definitely a game changer and when you don't do it or if you're not on time with it you definitely notice you know the the 
when you're getting towards the end of that cycle, you notice more irritability, more um, tiredness, you know, all the things that you kind of might have had before tea. Um, so it's, it's definitely something that you have to just do on time, right? Like if you forget, do you ever forget or do, are you just like dead on with it? Um, if I forget, it's like two or three days late. And then, then I have to remember, um, which day is the new day two weeks later. And so, and then I, hopefully I get it. Um, so I have to pick a day like a Saturday or a Sunday to do it. Um, so now I, I, re, I know it's every other weekend. So um, either, it doesn't matter if it's a Saturday or Sunday. So you found a cycle that works for you and you just yeah. stick to it. Yeah. Have you had to donate blood from having high hematocrit or no? No. Oh, well, that's awesome. So I'm curious on, you know, you've had this diagnosis and this fertility journey. Now you have a daughter. What, why do you want, why did you want to open up or, or why have you been open and why do you want to share your story and put yourself out there? Um, because I, I believe that there isn't enough of a community. Um, there isn't enough information for people like they need to know the information that i'm giving out they there's information in books but it's not very accurate um and i I would really like to to connect with the young moms that are you know questioning whether they should um abort or not or what to expect um with their with their baby uh what to expect with their with their son growing up um i think that would be um a life changing for me for for them for me to get their get the information to them that you know they're going they're sure there's going to be some struggles you know but it's not like uh down syndrome it's not re- retardation it's not you know, you know maybe you'll maybe the kid mom is mosaic who knows um um there's always options yeah i think it's it's definitely you know it's incredible to hear your story and and have you share and and it, what it's what it's doing is each guy that shares and opens up and each family that opens up about this diagnosis and tells their kid early instead of waiting until he's 12 or 13 and dropping the bomb on him like hey this is what you have like you know starting to tell them early with age appropriate information and getting them to embrace who they are and this isn't something that's shameful this is in our dna we can't change it this is this makes us special and like they say it's one in 500 so i look at myself as like the one person that's creative and outside the box thinker out of the 499 people that are stuck in a cubicle like the one track Mm -hmm. mind kind of they they're just another number whereas we are um we bring something special to this world um we're you know we're super kind caring empathy um very visually oriented observers we like to watch and kind of people watch pay attention to things before we just get like jump right in Mm -hmm. um it's it's definitely a blessing to have this and to change that like that per um that perspective switch of getting people to embrace this and like be like yeah this is awesome this isn't something yeah if we have yeah we've have, we have learning disabilities and we're infertile but like everyone in this world has something right like every right. single person has something wrong or something different about them but it's like not it's not talked about openly and i think we're coming into an age now where like m- there's more women that don't want to have kids and that like so dating with xxy if you're open about it like tell someone you might actually meet someone that is totally okay with the fact that you can't have kids i've met plenty of women in my life that um you know don't want kids or are totally okay with um the fact that you can't get them pregnant (laughs) yeah right (laughs) so there's, there's definitely positives out there um what would you tell i mean what would you tell those newly diagnosed moms or the adults that are kind of in your situation um take a deep breath and relax because um, if you let it, you let the kid grow up, um, 
with the correct information, um, then he's going to be successful. And what about the adults that are kind of getting later diagnosed, whether it's for fertility challenges or, um, you know, other diagnoses? Um, kind of the same thing. I mean, you know, you know, just take a deep breath and, um, and, you know, um, I guess learn about my story. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, I, I didn't, like I said, I wasn't diagnosed until I was 37. Um, and it was a shock, but, um, I got all the information that I could and I'm still learning and I'm, you know, still finding out things that, that, um, are crazy, you know, to think about. Um, but, Hey man, it's, it's life. You just gotta live there. So I I kind of have one last question about your daughter. So going forward in life and knowing that you guys did IVF and the the surgery, is it something that you have thought about telling your daughter on on kind of how how she came into this world or is it something that um yeah. you haven't really thought about yet? No, we'll we'll definitely share it with her uh when she's old enough to understand. Uh that's that's the plan. Well, is there anything else that um, you'd like to talk about or um, that we've kind of missed that you think or you think that you've put out enough of information out there about yourself? Uh, I think we've covered all the grounds that need to be covered. Well, it's been um, incredible hearing your, a little bit about your story. And um, for all those listening, this this podcast will also be available on YouTube. Um we will dive deep into Ted's life later on. Um, we're going to do a biography about his life and before his diagnosis, what, what his younger years were like, high school and, and after school and beyond. Um, so thank you so much for being on the show today, and um, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you.